we go, recording to the cloud. So our topic for today and indeed the um, next few weeks uh, is a plug flow reactor, which is our, our first um, new type of reactor. Um, the homework, there's a question in chat, the homework includes reversible reactions, unlike the ones covered in class. Um, does that change anything in the approach? We have actually covered quite a few reversible reactions, but there are also a few in the book that are covered. The only thing that it changes is the rate law. So our topic for the next few weeks, eh, maybe it's not a few weeks, but it's going to be a little while, are what are called plug flow reactors. So this is our third type of reactor. Um, so our first type was an equilibrium reactor, and then we did the CSTR. We spent a couple of weeks on the CSTR, um, and now we're under our last, or, sorry, second to last, possibly third to last, um, which is the plug flow reactor, which is a PFR. Um, if you've never built a plug flow reactor before, I don't blame you. However, they are really easy to build. Um, at least in concept, they are very easy to build. A plug flow reactor is a tube. And that's it. My um, professor back in 2000, I'm probably gonna date myself here. Uh, it must've been like 2006, something like that, taught me how to draw pipes like that. So now I draw my pipes like that. So you have a big pipe, fluid going in, fluid going out. Um, there's, there's plenty of things that we can do to make these more complicated than just a pipe, but at their core, a plug flow reactor is a pipe. Um, and so through the, the walls of that pipe, um, you can have a little bit of energy coming in or out, or a lot of energy coming in and out. So this is our cue that we saw. It's, it's a cue that's similar to the one that we saw for CSTR. It means the same thing, right? Energy is being... Um, transferred across the boundary of the, the reactor by usually a thermal gradient is the way that we do that. There's never any shaft work inside of a plug flow reactor. It's a, it's a long tube. Um, you can imagine if it's you know, circular in cross section, it's kind of hard to drill a hole uh, and then put a motor in there and then put like a fan or something on it in order to like mix stuff up. That, that's not really something that's easy to do. So not very many people do that. Um, the, it's just an otherwise sort of quote unquote empty tube, right? There, there's stuff in there, the reacting flow is in there, um, but there's no mixers or anything like that inside of here. The other um, key feature of a, a plug flow reactor is it's got a very uh, special type of um, flow pattern inside of it. So the flow pattern, if you imagine like a, a little line going through here uh, and you are a fluid element. If you are on the bottom of the tube, you're moving with one velocity. If you're a little bit above that, you move with exactly the same velocity. If you're anywhere other than that, you're always moving with exactly the same velocity, right? So this is uh, what we call plug flow. Um, and it's idealized. It's a, it's a type of flow that we can't actually achieve, um, much like a CSTR cannot instantaneously mix everything that goes into it. Um, a, a real flow inside of a tube cannot actually be plug flow. Um, so plug flow has two implications. One is that it's all uniformly moving from, in this case, left to right with exactly the same velocity, uh, but also it's not possible for it to sort of go out and turn around and come back um, or leave through the back and come back and go this way. So there's, there's no mixing, right? If, if you're a little packet of fluid and you're moving along inside of a, a plug flow reactor, the world is only you. Um, you can't see anything that's in front of you and you can't see anything that's um, behind you. You're just moving along smoothly from, from one side to the other. Um, that is in contrast to the two types of flow um, that you will deal with in CENG 101A. So the two types of flow that you deal with in there, and this is basically the only two types of flow that there are. One is parabolic. So if you are good at drawing parabolas, this is a parabolic fluid flow pattern. Um, and so the, the flow in the middle of the pipe is moving really, really fast, and the stuff on the edge is not moving quite so fast. Um, and then the other form is turbulent. Turbulent looks somewhat like plug flow. So we can get close if we do turbulent, because turbulent looks like this. 
right? So it still slows down near the edges, but out towards the middle of the pipe, it's all moving pretty fast and mostly in the same direction. But even turbulent is not quite plug flow because turbulent actually allows for some mixing in there. Um, plug flow is this idealized type of um, flow. So it, it's a pretty good approximation. In fact, switching from plug flow over to laminar flow doesn't, I mean, it, it makes the math quite a bit harder, um, but it, it does more or less behave the same way. Um, in fact, the approach is if you want a laminar flow reactor instead of a plug flow reactor, you kind of model the laminar flow as uh, lots and lots of shells of plug flow. Um, so it, it's a very useful um, type of, of flow. It's just a, a more uniform flow rate. Yeah, it's the, the key idea is it's uniform across the, the cross section of the pipe. Um, it can accelerate as it goes down the, the pipe um, if, if it's time dependent, but otherwise it's very uniform. Um, so we still get our old accumulation is equal to in oh, minus out plus change. That doesn't go anywhere. Uh, but it looks a little bit different. So instead of talking about the entire reactor um, from the inlet all the way to the outlet, we just focus our attention on a very small slice of the reactor. So we imagine taking this tiny little slice right here. Um, we're going to blow it up because I can't make my drawings um, quite as accurate as I need to. So the, the type of slice that we're interested in is kind of a disc shape, right? Because all of our plug flow reactors are going to be um, cylindrical, although there's no need for that. Um, so this will be our tiny slice. So we're just looking at some cross section of um, the reactor and then we get really lazy with uh, drawing because it's you know kind of tricky to draw this stuff. So we're just going to assume that the slice is a rectangle. Right, it still has that sort of disc shape to it. It's just easier to draw um, if it's a, a rectangle. So we're going to imagine that that particular slice, we're taking like the, the lab view, the, the view that I can look at that slice and watch material go through it, right? We're not taking the view of I am a chunk of material moving through the, the reactor. We're just looking at a particular slice of that reactor from the outside. Um, so there's still some in going into that slice and some out going into that slice the material that is entering that slice, the material that gets right up to here, by the time it gets up to the entry of the slice, it has been exposed to a volume of the reactor equal to V. We, we don't know how much, right? We could have just picked that slice to start anywhere that we wanted. Um, and then by the time it exits the slice over here on the edge, it has been exposed to a volume of the reactor equal to V plus a little bit. Um, and the mathematical way that we say a little bit is delta V. Uh, so the, the volume that was um, achieved from one side to the other, one side to the other, is delta V. Uh, that's how much volume um, the component has been exposed to. So there's some N sub I going in and some N sub I going out. Um, and so if we do a material balance on this, if it is operating at steady state, um, then you get zero because that's accumulation. The amount going in is however much n sub i you have evaluated at v, right, because it came in at a location of v um, after being exposed to v uh, volume, however much that happens to be, uh, and then subtract off of that how much is going out, which is n sub i evaluated at the point v plus delta v. The amount of change that's um, happened to that packet is r sub i delta v. Right, whatever the rate of change was, the rate of reaction inside of our little delta V segment, multiply that by the actual size of the delta V, um, and you've got yourself the, the change, right? Remember that uh, R sub I usually looks something like moles per volume per time. I'm just going to abbreviate that as second. So if you multiply that in our little infinitesimal slice volume, you'll end up with something that looks like a mole per second, um, and that's our, our change term um, that's sitting inside of here. So. The units on that kind of help to, to justify why it looks that way. So if you rearrange this uh, and then you take the limit as delta V gets really, really small, right? It, the limit as delta V goes to zero, uh, what you end up with is 
d sub n i over dv is equal to r sub i. And this is our material balance for anything inside of a plug flow reactor. This is our PFR material balance. That is very general. Um, this is for liquids, this is for gases, this is for one reaction, it's for five reactions. It, it's, it works for all of it. Um, everything about multiple reactions or phases or anything like that, it's all embedded inside the terms that are here, which is kind of impressive. There's only three terms there. There's an NI, a V, and an RI, um, and everything that we need is, is inside of there. Notice too that the units work out, right? So the R sub I is moles per volume per time. Uh, and then over on the other side, the derivative has the same units as the thing that is having its derivative taken. So the units of um, n sub i is moles per time. Uh, and on the bottom is a volume. Um, so we've got moles per time per volume or moles per volume per time on both sides, which is nice, right? It's, it's always good when unit conversions work out. The other thing that this needs to remember before in uh, Monday's lecture, sorry, they're collecting trash outside, so uh, hopefully that will be not that loud for very long. Um, the other thing that it always needs as an ordinary differential equation is an initial condition. Um, and so our initial condition is that most of the time we know that the um, molar flow rate of species I when V is equal to zero is whatever the inlet happens to be, right? So N sub I is zero. Um, it's just your, your inlet uh, molar flow rate. And typically, again, that, that's known, right? It's like either pure A or it's a 50-50 mixture of A and B, something like that. Um, but we usually know what's going on at the entrance. Um, occasionally, we know what's going on at the exit, and we have to guess the entrance until we get the exit that we need. Um, but ultimately, when it comes time to actually solve these things, we have to know where they started in most cases. Um, We'll see examples of that um, as we go. You can do um, almost exactly the same uh, procedure for the energy balance. So the big difference for the energy balance is you have to uh, account for not just the N sub I that's going in and coming out, but there's also enthalpy going in and enthalpy going out, um, as well as a little bit of Q, right? So it, if we track all of those in a uh, a form like we did for the CSTR, um, we get something similar except everything is built on this very tiny infinitesimal slice. And so we do the same trick of rearranging and taking a limit as the slice size goes to zero um, so that we can get um, a differential equation. And so our differential equation for the energy balance, we're mostly interested in temperature, so it, it is always written as um, temperature, is that the rate of change of temperature with respect to volume, so dt dv, uh, is equal to a fraction. Uh, and we're going to spend more time with this fraction later today and then in the rest of our examples. Uh, delta Q minus the sum of R sub J delta H sub J divided by the sum of N sub I C sub P comma I. This is our energy balance. I'm gonna box it and then spend a little bit of time highlighting the various uh, parameters so that um, we can talk a little bit more about it. This is our PFR energy balance. It's subject to the same assumptions that we had for our CSTR, namely that CP for anything is constant. It doesn't mean that they're equal, right? I can have a heat capacity for water and a heat capacity for alcohol, and that's fine. Um, but they're, they're constant, so they're, they are not functions of temperature. Um, they just, they don't change. Uh, and then the other part is that there is no phase change. Right, so if something comes in as a liquid, it leaves as a liquid. If it comes in as a gas, then it comes out as a gas. Um, it, it's okay if you are feeding a liquid and a gas as long as it is not changing phases. Shouldn't it be um, Ni0 and Hi0 for the inlet? Uh, if you're referring to these up here, yes, that it's the enthalpy at the inlet and the enthalpy at the outlet. Similarly, N sub I at the inlet um, and N sub I at the outlet. The, um, oops, 
wrong color. The energy balance also has an initial condition. And that initial condition is that the temperature of the material at the inlet to the reactor, which is V is equal to zero, uh, is equal to T sub zero. So this, oh, I already wrote inlet. I might as well just keep the inlet right there since I've already got it. This inlet uh, is actually referring to the same thing. Right, so N sub I zero is your inlet moles and T sub zero is your uh, inlet temperature. A Couple of weird things about our um, energy balance. The first one is this delta Q. We already have a delta somewhere else um, and the other delta was the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients. It's not the same delta. Uh, we, we have run out of symbols. Um, this delta Q is all one term. Right, so when I say delta Q, I mean that is a, a delta Q. It, it, you would never separate the delta and the Q. It's all one term, right? It's the same way that R sub J, it's never like I have an R and a J, right? It's always R sub J. Um, the, the sub J always goes along with it. In this particular case, the delta Q here always goes along with uh, it, as a pair. Um, you know, I would never split DT into a D and a T. I would never split DV into a D and a V. I will never split the delta and the Q into a delta and a Q. It, it's one lumped term um, and it will always be um, appearing in that particular way. The delta Q that's up there, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Why can't I use DQ? Well, if I use DQ, that means a derivative and it's not a derivative. If I use a delta Q, we've already used a delta Q and that would imply that it's the sum of this times Q sub I and that's not true. If I use the partial Q, which is the partial derivative, that's not true because it's not a partial derivative. <laughs> so we've just run out of symbols, right? I, we need a symbol to mean a small amount of energy um, and we're just, we're out of symbols that mean a small amount of, of en energy. Partial Q would be like if you were doing a, a partial differential equation. So delta Q, uh, fortunately it has a, a definition that's very similar to what we've seen before, uh, which is UA times TU minus T. So uh, the TU, oh, I need blue. This is our utility temperature. So that would be something like our steam or our water or something like that. Um, the T here is our reactor temperature. Uh, U is the same thing um, that it meant before, uh, which is our heat transfer. X for means transfer coefficient. The weird one here is the A. Uh, we're gonna get to that later this afternoon. Um, so we will come back to the little a, uh, and then the last one here is delta Q. This is heat transfer per unit volume. And that's that's the weird part, right? So that's why we're going to, to spend a little bit of time um, on that later, uh, is because that's a weird looking delta Q. Um, it's not really one that, that we've seen before. Um, so we're going to spend some more time on that um, later this afternoon. This expression and the derivation that led to it is 7.19 in your book. The um, energy balance is 7.2 and the material balance is 7.1. Um, very similar to the way in the CSTR that we can always come back to the general um, forms, we can do that here as well, right? We can always come back to these general forms um, in order to solve a problem. It's just a question of whether or not that's the most convenient uh, form for it, or if it's kind of inconvenient, um, then maybe we'll use uh, something else. Uh, but for at least the next few um, days, we're just going to stick to to these. Uh, the thing written under the A here uh, says later. Um, we're going to use that. We're going to look at that later today um, in the afternoon. But for now, we're just going to focus on this one, which is our material balance. Um, 
this afternoon, we'll get to the energy balance. And then when we get to the energy balance, we'll talk about that delta Q um, a little bit more. Delta Q hides something. We're actually going to have a good time uh, later this afternoon. Um, delta Q hides something that is subtle and dangerous. Um, so we're going to spend some time um, talking about it. Don't snap to grid. None. And uh, I can't select six. Sorry, I'm trying to get my green pen to work here. Save as pen six. There we go. We're going to need that green pen later. I finally need a fourth color. So let's take a look at an example of, of what the solution process inside of a, a plug flow reactor looks like, which in another way of speaking is how do we apply the, the general material balance um, and how does that application compare to the CSTR? Um, since we've got the, the CSTR sort of under our belt already, um, we can compare this uh, to those CSTRs. So this is example nine, or sorry, yeah, not example nine, example from lecture nine. The only thing that we're gonna do uh, is instead of the um, CSTR, we're now going to model this as a PFR. So our PFRs will generally look like rectangles, just to remind us that these are tubes, um, whereas our CSTRs were usually squares, because uh, they look a little bit more like a, a squat cylinder um, than a, a tube. So the example from um, lecture nine was a, a liquid phase reaction. It was one of the very first ones that we'd ever done uh, with our sort of combined power of a material balance and our rate laws and all of that kind of stuff. So the stuff coming in was a liquid um, and it, we had said CA zero was two moles per second, or sorry, two moles per liter. Didn't have a unit of time, it's per vol unit volume. Um, and we had said that the inlet volumetric flow rate was four liters per second. The reaction that happened inside of here was just a simple A goes to B. Uh, it was elementary. It had a fixed um, rate constant of 0 0.02 per second. And the question that we had asked was, what was the volume uh, to get 50% conversion of A? We had actually solved this, uh, and for a CSTR, uh, we found that the volume required was 200 liters. Um, and so now our goal is do the same thing, but for a PFR, right? It, it, that's, it's been drawn differently. We've got a, a different label on here. Let's see what volume we would get if we did exactly the same conditions, the same reaction on all of that. Uh, the only thing is we're gonna change the, the shape and the flow pattern um, to that of a, a plug flow reactor. So we start off with our um, general definition of the material balance. We're gonna write it on A because we've only got one component in here, it's, it's A. Uh, so the DNA DV term uh, will be equal to R sub A. Remember, we've got multiple Vs floating around. The V that's in the bottom here um, is always the volume. It will always be the volume. We will never have the um, volumetric flow rate appear in the denominator. Um, it will always be volume. So I, again, I'll try to keep those caps rolling along on there. Um, but if for some reason I forget, um, the, the term in the bottom is always volume. It will appear close to the volumetric flow rate um, as we'll, we'll see here in a moment. Um, so it is important to, to keep the two um, separate in your minds. So R sub A is the stoichiometric coefficient of A times R. The stoichiometric coefficient of A is minus one because it's A goes to B. The rate uh, is the same as we've seen before, which is just K sub CA. Uh, this is now minus K. The, by definition, C sub A is NA over V. That little V, remember because I used it here on the um, concentration term, this is your volumetric flow rate. So I'm only reminding you because these things show up very close to each other right now. Um, and so this uh, is also equal to K times NA over V0. And here again, we were allowed to do that because this is a liquid. If this were a gas, we would have to use that bigger expression that we learned from the ideal gas law about a week ago uh, in order to represent the volumetric flow rate anywhere inside of our, our system. 
that's as far as I want to take this. The initial condition is that Na0 is equal to 8 moles per second. So I wrote that way over here. Oops. This is our initial condition, which we abbreviate as IC. So it, it's not part of the equation in the sense that it's not algebraically involved with it yet. It will be because we're going to do calculus. Yeah, calculus. Um, but we, we still need it, right? We, we can't solve for these things um, without uh, the initial condition. Um, remember, anytime that you're ever asked to solve one of these by hand, or anytime that you can solve them by hand, um, they're almost uniformly going to be what we call separable differential equations. Um, and so what that means is I need to pull everything that has to do with Na over on one side, and I'm just going to throw everything else on the other side. Um, it's very rare that it ever depends on volume, but if there were any terms that required volume, um, they would go on the volume side. So dNa, get it? Okay, I can hear you cringing. That's good enough for me. Yeet. DNA over NA. Thank you. Thank you. I try. I really do try. Uh, move the NA over onto one side. Um, move the DV over onto the other side. Uh, and so I'll have minus K divided by V0 times DV. So now maybe you can see why the caps are so uh, relevant, um, because the Vs and the Vs, they get kind of close to each other. Um, and if I had left off the, the caps, you might be tempted to integrate that as though the V were in the denominator um, when it's not. So that's what, that is the separable part of the separable differential equation. Um, so now we can go ahead and integrate it. That is a, I have a really hard time drawing uh, the integral sign on the, the little Wacom tablet. So we're going to integrate this from um, inlet to outlet. So in the bottom here, let me change the color of this. The lower part of the, the integral uh, will be the inlet conditions. And the upper part of the integral will be the outlet conditions. Uh, so the inlet conditions are the things that we already know. Um, and so for example, for N sub A, the inlet conditions are Na0. For the volume, the inlet condition for volume is that it's zero, right? Volume started off at zero, um, and so that's where the lower bound is there. The outlet condition is the part where we're a little bit sloppy. Uh, we usually just abbreviate it as N sub A and V, right? It's whatever the volume is at the outlet of the reactor and whatever the N sub A is at the outlet of the reactor. Um, if we happen to know that as a number, we can include the numbers if we want to. Um, so for example, Na0 is actually equal to 8 uh, because that's our, our inlet condition. This came from that. Um, that's how we knew that particular number. Now we would um, integrate these things. However you choose to um, integrate them is, is fine by me. Um, this one is not too bad because you'll just get a natural log on one side. Um, so you'll have N sub A uh, is equal to Na0 times the exponential function of minus k divided by v0 times the volume v. So again, it's important there to, to if, if you don't draw caps, remind yourself somehow that that volume is not the same as the volumetric flow rate um, because they are right next to each other right now. Um, and if this were a liquid and you were to incorrectly assume that this v was actually the volumetric flow rate, that whole side would just cancel out, which would be a problem. Well, it wouldn't cancel out. It'd be the exponential of minus one uh, or minus k, uh, which would just be incorrect. The reason that I wrote it this way, it, it's not actually helpful in terms of what we need to, to solve for here. The reason that I wrote it this way is because often we want what is called a profile for these reactors. Um, and so a, a profile of n sub a would look like n sub a as a function of v. How would you get that profile if you weren't solving this in MATLAB? you would do what we just did, right? Do the integral, uh, and this is your profile, right? With this ability, you have, or with this equation, you now have the ability to plot N sub A across the entire volume of your reactor. Um, and in this case, it's an exponential uh, decay. So it'll go down, something like that. So this is what we call a profile. 
uh, we can have different profiles. We can have temperature profiles, molar flow rate profiles, concentration profiles, velocity profiles, um, lots of different things. Where did we get uh, what equation? Oh yeah, we um, evaluated the integral, right? So we took this one um, and went down to here. So we integrate and then I rearranged a little bit. So we did some um, calculus there to get that. That's not what the question asked us for. The question didn't ask us for the profile. I'm just pointing out that you will be asked for profiles eventually. Um, so it's useful to know where they would come from in this particular um, expression. What we wanted to know was uh, what's the volume for 50% conversion? Well, if we have 50% conversion, we know that Na from stoichiometry is equal to Na0 times 1 minus Xa, which is a, an easy one for this, which is just 4 moles per second, right? Half of the inlet. So we can take this now and substitute it into our profile, which is here. We will know N sub A0 because that's 8. We know K, we know V0 because those were both given to us. Uh, and the only unknown in here will be the, the volume. Um, and so we'll be able to solve that. Right, so this will look like 4 is equal to 8 times the exponential of minus, what was our k? 0 0.02 divided by the volumetric flow rate. Our volumetric flow rate was 4 times v. We'll just have one unknown, which is now v, uh, which we can solve to get 138.6 liters. That would be considered our answer for this one. That was what the, the problem actually asked us to do, was, was solve for that. Uh, if you compare that to the volume for a CSTR, that was 200 liters. So we didn't have to change anything about our, our system in the sense that we can pump exactly the same stuff through at exactly the same temperature. We don't know the temperature here, but whatever it was, use the same temperature use the, the same rate law, same volumetric flow rate, same inlet concentration, all of that stuff. But if we just change the way in which it flows through the reactor, right? Instead of dumping into a big bucket and just getting stirred around and then brought out, if instead of that, we have a, a circular tube and we send it down the tube, we don't need a tube that was big as big anymore, right? The, the tube size is like close to half as small as the, the bucket size, right? The CSTR size. Um, and that is sort of a, a hallmark of first order reactions um, is they, they all tend to do better in a plug flow reactor than they do in a CSTR. Um, if the rate law were different, if it weren't a first order rate law, then it's not quite so easy to pick which one is which. Um, we do have a, a tricky way to pick which one will end up giving the smaller volume without having to actually solve for everything, um, but that's later on in the book. But this is the, the general approach of what solving a, a typical plug flow reactor type problem um, would look like. I don't know what MAFF means. Um, the equation we just solved for NA is only valid for problems with minus one uh, as stoic for A. So I would not take this equation, this one, do not take that as gospel. Uh, this is, yes, math, okay, um, now I get it. So this equation, generally you should assume is different for each problem. Not just each stoichiometry, uh, not just each um, reactor design. Uh, every time that you come up with a come up against a, a plug flow reactor problem, you should never start with an equation like this. You should always start with the differential form. Um, this one, the one that's highlighted here, that's the only one that's general for everything. Um, anything after that, such as this green one here that I've boxed, that's specific to that problem. And so you should never grab that particular equation and just assume that it works for yours. Um, it, it, it usually will not. Uh, and so you'll have to solve for a, a separate one, a different one. Uh, we got about, what is that, seven minutes now before Fika? Um, actually, okay. Give me a quick, let's do a quick vote. I can do a poll here, I think. Can't we do a poll? Yeah. 
Yes. Polls. Add question. Oh, never mind. The polls have to go through the, the website. I'm not going to do that noise. Um, if you want to see MATLAB, like how would I do this problem in MATLAB, give me a yes in chat. If you would rather see another handworked example, give me a no in chat. So yes means give me MATLAB, no means do another um, hand problem. Use the participants window. Um, I can't keep track of everything on the, the group chat. Okay, so we got, okay, the preference here is, seems to be MATLAB. We will come back to the hand calculation in a moment. Um, we, we will get there after MATLAB, but since we've got uh, this one, um, we'll do the MATLAB first, and then after FICA, we'll do the hand um, example. So let's switch over to MATLAB real quick. Don't worry, we, we will do both. So if, if you prefer the hand example, don't worry, we'll come back to it. Here's MATLAB. All right, so what would that look like in MATLAB? Um, remember the, the uh, general form that we've got for these problems is gonna use ODE45 instead of FSolve. Um, and the way that that starts is you can kind of build the, the whole system around this first equation. The thing that ODE45 is going to give you um, is two sets of information, right? It's gonna give you a list of volumes and it's gonna give you a list of moles um, and that's that's the output to ODE45, ODE45. The input to ODE45, you're gonna to have to give it the function, um, which will be your derivative function um, that we'll define here in a minute. You have to give it the range over which you would like it to solve. Um, so here our range is zero to 200, and you have to tell it where to get started. So what was the very first value of NA? It was NA zero, right? So this is, is where we're going to get started. Right up above it, we can quickly define that NA0 was um, eight moles per second, because that's a nice um, convenient one. So this is in class example one. Um, and then if we just wanted to quickly get our um, profile, we'll, we'll calculate the rest of it here in a minute, um, but it's easy enough to get our, our profile as this. So we weren't, again, we weren't asked for a profile, but since we found it the other way, we might as well find it here. The function similarly always has a, a very similar feel to it. Um, it always starts off with function is equal to the derivative that you want. So in this case, DNA DV is equal to a function. And this is part of the tricky part of the syntax. You always have to include both variables and it always has to go from independent variable. So the, the thing in the bottom uh, versus dependent variable, right? So our, our dependent variable in this case is um, N sub A. There's a question is PFR volume always less than CSTR? No. The range doesn't always go up to 200. In this case, the range goes up to 200 because that's the volume of our reactor. All right, so we could also say this. It's 200. Will the profile always be V versus NA? Uh, pretty much. Um, it'll be V versus something, right? We can have a temperature profile or a mole flow profile or a conversion profile or, or anything else that we wanted that varies as the volume does. So this is the, the general form of our, our function. And similarly to the way that I like to do the, the CSTR functions for the, the F solve, I kind of like to work backwards, right? So I know the thing that I have to end up with is DNA DV, right? That's our, our derivative, DNA DV. And I know from my general um, material balance that DNA DV uh, is always just going to be equal to RA. This is our general material balance. So now I can kind of work backwards, right? If, if all I know is V and NA, those are the things that are coming into the function, how do I get to the point where I can calculate R sub A? I just have to start adding in information, right? So among other things, I know I need NA zero is gonna be equal to eight, uh, and this is moles per second. I know K is gonna be equal to 0 0.02, and that was inverse seconds. Um, let's see, what else did I need to know? I need to know that V0 um, is equal to four liters per second. Um, C sub A is always gonna be equal to NA divided by V0, and that's gonna end up as moles per liter. And then I can calculate my rate as R is equal to K times CA, which will be mole per liter per second. And I know that RA is equal to a quantity of minus one times R. Right, this is our, our net rate expression. 
So similarly to the, the way that I could build those things up from um, CSTR, it's sort of in a, a backward sense. I can build them up from PFRs in a backward sense as well if I start by writing this, right? And I, I can check that very easily because I can just look over at my book and find out, yeah, I wrote the general material balance correctly. At least I didn't mess up that part, right? I, I certainly could have messed up elsewhere. MATLAB is warning me that a couple of things are not needed. So if you highlight or if you hover on NA0, you may not be able to see the pop-up on there, but you can probably see that NA0 is highlighted with orange or underlined in orange. Um, it's just saying you don't need this to, to calculate anything because I haven't actually used NA0 anyway. Um, and so I'm going to uh, just delete that because I don't need um, that particular one. So save this as in class one. There we go. Let's go ahead and run that. And I will um, dock my profile here. So here's what our profile looks like. Something like that. And so the question was, what volume do we need in order to get 50% um, conversion, right? So I could read that off of the plot if I wanted to. If I hold the plot and draw a line um, at four, Right, the, the value at which I achieve 50% conversion um, is going to be at that intersection. Um, I could just read it off of the plot if I wanted to. So I could just grab my uh, cursors here and sort of zoom in, get nice and close to it. That's pretty accurate, right? Somewhere around 138.6 um, or so is, is roughly what we're getting. And that's very close to what we got when we solved it analytically. Um, and in fact, the, the two are, are essentially identical. Another way that I could figure out how far I have to go in order to get 50% um, conversion with an output like this, remember what I'm getting out is a, a set of data, right? I'm getting a, a list of V values and I'm getting a list of N sub A values. And so I could look directly at that list um, and try to find out where the two intersect. Um, so if I look at that list, this is my list of data, right? Remember from Monday's lecture, I get a column vector of V and I get a column vector of N sub A. The very first element will always be the initial volume, which was zero, and the initial, uh, the inlet molar flow rate of A, which is eight. And you can see here that it's just kind of dropping down, right? If you want to know where these numbers came from, go check out Monday's lecture, and you can use exactly that same approach here and get very, very similar numbers to what MATLAB got. Not quite the same. MATLAB's quite a bit more accurate than we tend to be by hand, but the same procedure will, will give you similar results. Um, and so I can scroll down through here and try to figure out where I actually got to four, which is somewhere between 135 and 140, which is, again, very close to what we got analytically, which was 138.6. If you need the value at a, uh, if, if you need a value that is not directly inside of here, then you'll have to use one of the tricks that's in the book. Um, and so I, we are sort of out of time with, with this one, but um, if for it, you ever need to provide an answer, uh, you know, I ask you how to get, what is the volume for 50% conversion, you can absolutely just use the plot um, because you can zoom in two, three times and get it accurate to two, three decimal points very, very quickly, right? There's no reason that I have to stop here. I can just keep going and going and going. If you don't want to deal with figuring out how to get exactly the value out, then you can just zoom in. Interp one is one option, but th there's actually another way to not output the data like this, but to output it as a more general data set um, that will allow you to calculate that sort of stuff. But the plot is totally fine. Um, if, if you don't wanna mess around with the other stuff that's in the book, no worries, don't worry about it. Just zoom in on the plot. Um, you will get a, an appropriately sized answer. All right, so we are at 2.47. We are two minutes past FICA. Um, I'm gonna leave this code up here in case you um, couldn't do all of this uh, as, fast, as quickly as I could type it, totally fine. I will also post the code after class, um, so you can always get it that way. Um, and we'll turn on our... Uh, yeah, let's see. How do you dock figures? The way that you dock figures is when they're undocked, there's a little uh, down arrow here in the top right corner.
can you see the pop-up that's coming up? Because I can share my desktop if you want to Because there should be a pop-up visible right now. You can see the pop-up, perfect. So if you can see the pop-up right here where it says undock, that same option will be there when the figure is not inside of MATLAB, except it won't say undock, it'll say dock. Um, and then get it put inside there. Music's really loud, thank you. I'll turn it back. How's that? Better? Cool. Yeah, tell me if the music's too loud, I don't want that. Okay. So for Fika today, got myself an Oreo, it's classic. And I, I pre-made the coffee because I noticed that I couldn't drink the coffee as quickly as I needed to because um, it was too hot when I would make it right when I wanted it. so great we've still got eight minutes and i can actually drink my coffee um so there's a, a question in chat which um and by the way usually i will not um obviously i can see who asked the question um but if you message me privately i will generally try to avoid saying your name because i assume that you meant that to be a private communication um so i'll just answer those as you may have known i mean it's week five i imagine you picked up on this um i'll just answer the question right that, as though someone in chat had said it um, it, it just always stuck with me. I, we really do read our capes as professors. Um, and someone had asked, or someone had written in a, a cape response like two, three years ago, the class size was like 12 people. Um, and occasionally in my emails, I would say stuff like, you know, at the end of class, a student had asked X and Y. Um, and they said, well, like, you know who we are, just say the name. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm actually doing that on purpose. Um, 
mostly to protect as much of your anonymity as I can. Granted, in a class of like 10, 20 people, it's kind of hard. Um, but this is why I'm usually not addressing you by name when you um, send a chat to me. And I'm totally okay with this, by the way. I'm, I'm just telling you a little bit about how we operate. Or, yeah, we, the, the royal we, how I operate. So there's a question in chat. How would you approach um, problem 3.2 on the homework? Not a problem. Let me resize this and share it. Yeah, sure. We can do that muting. Do another question. So the question is, how do we go about um, problem 3.2? Um, in order to calculate V0, I'll just add a comment right on my comment window. So to calculate V0, come on, comment window, I would use the ideal gas law. that as the ideal gas law. To calculate the inlet partial pressures, the inlet partial pressures I would calculate as P sub I zero is equal to Y sub I zero times P zero. Right, so P zero is your total pr inlet pressure um, and Y sub I zero is your, um, excuse me, inlet mole fraction. This one may also need the ideal gas law. Um, and then finally, the, uh, find the conversion of um, ethylene in a 2.5 cubic meter fluidized bed reactor. Um, that will look very much the same as it uh, would for uh, the other CSTRs where, uh, personally, I would start off with um, the general material balance, although you can also use the conversion one. Um, the conversion-based one will give you the, the same amount. Um, and so I would start off with um, something that looks like this. Uh, and then the key point will be that these rate laws uh, will be now functions of your partial pressure. So in order to evaluate the partial pressure, um, the partial pressure at any point, P sub I will be equal to N sub I divided by the sum of N sub I, because that's your total, uh, and then times whatever the pressure happens to be um, at that particular point. And so your, your code will kind of have a, a few steps, right? The first step above it will be, um, you know, define these particular uh, quantities. And then underneath it, you would define R is equal to K times, you know, PA times PE times PO, right? Times all of those other terms. Uh, and then everything after that looks more or less like a, a CSTR um, typically would. So. That's, that's how I would go about that approach. Can I provide um, approximate answers for question two? Uh, I think I've got some, hang on. This was our vinyl acetate. I'll just put them up here where there's a little bit more room. Uh, about oh, 
Come on, type. Make it a type. Thank you. Two e to the four liters per minute. It is some 1997 JRPG vibes. Um, part B. What was Part B asking for? Inlet partial pressure of ethylene and inlet molar concentration of ethylene. I'm just going to give the inlet partial pressure. Um, inlet partial pressure, P sub I. Uh, about 180 kPa for ethylene. Was part C. Find the conversion inside of that. And your conversion will be uh, somewhere between 70 to 90 percent. Somewhere in that range. Since I gave them here, I'll also post them on the um, website too. You're welcome. John, I would lean towards the, the latter of, of what you said there. I, I would not try to, if, if you can spot the error in the code, go for it. Um, but if, if it's not obvious, then I would go for, like, is the approach correct or not? Um, I mean, if, if you can spot an obvious error in the code, go for it uh, and provide that. But otherwise, um, you know, fo focus on um, approach rather than um, debugging. But it's perfectly fine. If, if you find, if you can see where the error is, you're more than welcome to just tell them. That's fine. Sometimes that stuff can be really hard to, to track down if, if you've been staring at, as anybody has noticed, if you've ever tried to track down your own algebraic mistake, it can be really hard. Um, so it's, it's nice if somebody just tells you where the mistake was, if they can find it. Um, they may not be able to find it. All right, let's look at one more quick example um, before we get to the um, energy balance material. So this example is from lecture 10. This is a great thing when you change reactors. If you've already done the example in one reactor, it's really easy to make another example. You just do the same thing. Um, so in that uh, example, we obviously had a CSTR, but now we've got a, a PFR. So we've got our PFR here. Um, and this was the one where we were dealing with um, isomerization of uh, metaxylene, sorry, orthoxylene to metaxylene. And so we were moving that little stick, uh, the little methyl group that stuck on top of the um, orthoxylene was getting moved in a reversible reaction. Uh, and that reversible reaction 
uh, moved the stick. You know, honestly, I, I never remember which one is which. I'm pretty sure Meta's on the bottom. Um, it, or no, it, it can't be on the bottom. It's, it's the one over here on the, the slightly to the right, not all the way to the right. Um, so this one, it was here, and then it got moved. Right, the, the blue one stayed there. Is that what it goes? It goes ortho, meta, para, just in a nice little angle? That's convenient. Um, I never knew that. So if that's the case, then I'll fix up my sticks. Ortho, meta. Oh. Meta. Get those sticks the right size. At any rate, it was uh, ortho xylene goes to meta xylene. Um, and we had fed in pure A. So our ortho was um, A and our meta was B. Um, this was pure. It was coming in at a concentration of 8.5 moles per liter uh, and a volumetric flow rate of one liter per minute. The reversible elementary liquid phase reaction was A goes to B. Um, it took place at 90 degrees C. Um, we, in the, the previous problem, we had to sort of adjust the activation energy and adjust the um, equilibrium constant for 90 degrees C. I'm not going to repeat that adjustment here. I'm just going to give the values at, at 90, 90 degrees C um, because I'm more interested in the, the PFR point um, and not how we came up with these. Uh, so this was at 90 degrees C. Um, and similarly, our KC, which again is equal to KA times CT to the delta. Um, but here, delta is zero because it's a one-to-one -one goes reaction, so we don't have that uh, term. And so Kc is just equal to Ka, um, which again, we calculated all of this in lecture 10. So if any of these are, are unclear, um, it's all recorded and posted. So have at it uh, at 90 degrees C. Um, so we, we had that stuff. Um, and what we had been asked for was if we were given the volume uh, is equal to 200 liters, what's the conversion of, X, of A, right? What's X of A? Last time, obviously, it was a, a CSTR. Um, this time, it is a PFR. The previous conversion um, that we had found, did I actually write down what the, yeah, I did. It was 44.7. So we worked this problem for a CSTR and found it was 44.7. Let's work it quickly for a um, PFR. The approach looks very much like what it just did for the other one. DNA DV is equal to RA, right? We can always start with the, the general material balance. That is still going to be equal to minus one times R. And in this case, R, because it's a reversible reaction, can be written as CA minus CB divided by KC times the rate constant, which is K. And now I want to, tr since the um, derivative is written with respect to Na, I would like to replace these with um, expressions of Na, if I possibly can. So the two Ks are okay. I can leave these, this K and this K. Those are perfectly fine. Those, they can just hang out, right? They're essentially constants. Um, so I'll still have minus K. But C sub A, since it's a liquid, can be written as Na over V0. And C sub B, which we had shown in the previous one by stoichiometry, uh, is equal to Na0 minus Na uh, divided by V0. And then that will be multiplied by Kc. So that was the form that we had. And then our initial condition, which is new for a PFR, is that we start with 8.5 moles per minute uh, because that was given to us up in the problem statement. E I think I've actually, yeah, there's ever so slightly more room off to the left here, moles per minute. Sure, those structures are here. So uh, in order to solve this thing, um, it, it has to be a separable differential equation if I'm going to do it by hand. So I need to take any of the terms over here that have to do with Na, and I need to move them over Look at the size of that arrow. Move them over to the, the left-hand side. Um, and then similarly, anything that's kind of a constant by convention, we just throw all the constants on the volume side, um, if they can go on the volume side. Uh, and anything else just goes on the volume side. So this looks, uh, there's going to be some algebra here. I 
trying to draw a face, but I'm not very good at drawing faces. If you do a little bit of algebra, I'm not doing any integration yet. I'm just doing algebra. Um, you can get DNA over one plus KC times NA minus NA zero um, is equal to minus K divided by V zero times KC. And then the, the DV term is, is over here on the right. So I, I just did algebra there, um, but uh, I mean, I say just did algebra there, but I screwed it up enough times that it's worth pointing out that it's not trivial. Um, at this point, uh, in order to integrate these, I'm gonna erase that word algebra because it's in the way of my integral. I'm gonna set up my integrals nasty as those integral signs may look. Uh, I have to integrate from the lower bound, which for Na is 8.5, and that corresponds to a time or a, a volume when uh, volume of reactor equal to zero because it's at the inlet of the reactor. Uh, and then I'm going to integrate that up across the volume of the reactor, which is 200 liters, um, and then to some unknown n sub a. Right? I would, I'm trying to figure out what n sub a is. That's my outlet term. Um, so I don't know what n sub a is. Uh, so I just leave it as an unknown, which is um, n sub a. If I want to do that integral, this is about as complicated as they come. Uh, so not integrals, obviously. Integrals can be very complicated. Uh, but as complicated as they're going to come that you might have to solve by hand. So in the book, uh, in Appendix A, there are common um, integrals that you might need. So you can go look up this form in uh, Appendix A as equation A.5, uh, and you will see that the result, which you might be able to see it anyway, um, if you have recently brushed up on your calculus, uh, which maybe you have, maybe you haven't. It's okay if you haven't. That's why the appendix is there. Will looks like this, right? And it's fairly nasty looking, one plus KC on top, NA, minus Na zero, one plus Kc on the bottom, Na zero minus Na zero. Kind of messed up my zero up there on the top. Let's neaten that up a little bit. There we go. Uh, and all of this has to be equal to minus K, the rate constant times the volume, which is 200 liters, divided by V zero times Kc. which is not great, right? Uh, the thing that we need is right here, but look at everything else that we've got, right? We know K sub C here, we know it here and here. Na zero is constant, it's 8.5. We know the rate, we know the volumetric flow rate, we know the KC, we know the volume. So it's one equation with one unknown. You could algebraically rearrange it, you could throw it into MATLAB if you wanted to. Um, the algebra is not, terrible um, if you rearrange that, but I'm not going to spend eight minutes on algebra that I'm almost guaranteed to mess up on camera. Um, there's no sense in recording your mistakes if you can avoid it, so I just did the math beforehand. So I get Na is uh, 3.27 moles per minute. From this, we can then calculate that the conversion of A is 1 minus the outlet over the inlet, so 3.27 over 8.5. Um, and we get 61.5%, which is again higher than what we would have gotten in a, a CSTR, which at this point you may be asking yourself like, well, what, what is the point of even having a CSTR if a plug flow reactor can always do better? It can't always do better. It's just the problems that we can solve by hand are the ones that happen to correspond for, to the ones that have better characteristics in a PFR. Um, so it's only a consequence of I want to be able to solve it by hand, um, that all of these tend to look like they're better for a PFR versus 44.7%, uh, right? This was our CSTR volume or CSTR conversion, right? But the approach looks very similar to the, the um, example that we just saw a moment ago. Um, and it all starts with the general material balance, which was right here. Right, everything that happened after that to the right of here, that was substituting in all of exactly the same relationships that we had for CSTRs, for rate laws and stuff like that, because those rate laws are the same, right? It doesn't matter which 
reactor it's it's taking place in. The difference was in the setup, and then obviously we had to have an integration like this, um, which which made it a little bit um, different. But that that's sort of how most of these feel, right? You expand out the rate law on the right hand side. You you start rearranging stuff until you can finally get everything in terms of a, an NA, um, and then you do the integration. There was a, a question in chat, would a PFR also mix it like a CSTR? No, in a PFR, there's no mixing, right? Think, think tube, right? When you hear PFR or plug flow reactor, think empty pipe, right? All that's happening is you're just flowing stuff down a pipe because um, that's all the plug flow reactor is. There's no like magnetic stir, no propeller, impeller, anything like that um, that is, is sitting inside of there. Um, that's mixing anything up. It's, it's just a, an empty pipe through which stuff happens to be flowing. Um, let me grab the book, go over to our plug flow reactor. So what does a real plug flow reactor look like? It tends to look like one of these. I got to grab a screenshot here. Let's move this. And actually, let's make it a little bit bigger. And move it down here. And we'll get to it in a minute. Uh, there were a couple of questions in chat. Would the denominator be Na minus Na0? Uh, not in the integrated form. Uh, in the integrated form, it's Na0 on both of them. Um, are there any special PFRs? Um, Yes, we're gonna look at two of them. Uh, that's what this image is for. Um, these are the, the two primary ones. We don't have too many other ones. What would be the advantages of using a CSTR over a, a PFR if the conversion rate of a PFR is much greater than a CSTR? Uh, cost, um, it, it often comes down to which one can you control um, more easily. Uh, which is part of what we're gonna talk about with the, the energy balance. But usually if the conversion rate in one of them is like 30% higher than the other, you're gonna go with the higher one um, because ultimately that you'll, it'll be more cost effective to do. But you won't know that until you compare the two, right? That's um, part of the problem. So um, PFR heat exchangers. PFR heat exchangers. We had kind of left that delta Q term alone a minute ago. We're going to come back to it now. But first, I want you to have a visual of what does a heat exchanger for a, a CSTR look like, or excuse me, for a PFR. For a CSTR, the heat exchangers came in one of two forms, right? We would either sort of, if my head is the CSTR, we would wrap my head in like a, a basically a blanket, right? And then flow water through it in order to cool it or flow steam through it in order to cool it. Um, or we might like stick a straw in, spiral it around and bring it back out and then pump a fluid through the inside of the straw. That could be one way. We don't often do that with PFRs. Um, we can jacket a PFR. Um, and so the, the one that's shown here on the left is what we call a jacketed PFR. Uh, and the way that that works is your, your primary flow, the, the thing that's actually reacting is going through the inside of the pipe. And it, it is usually curved like this um, because often the lengths that we need for something like this are really big. They're like hundreds of meters or something like that. And it's not practical to design a tube in a building somewhere that just runs for like 100 meters or something. It's easier if it goes, you know, 10 meters and turns around, 10 meters, turns around, 10 meters, turns around, something like that. So it's common to see these things kind of snake uh, rather than just be a straight long tube. Around that tube, right, if, if you imagine here's your tube and then you slide another tube over it, you'll have an annulus in between the two tubes. So if you imagine a cross-sectional slice across the, the drawing that's right here, it would look like a tube here and then another tube outside, right? And maybe there's water on the outside tube uh, and then there's the process fluid on the inside of the tube in here. Right, so the process fluid is hot and you've got a cold water flowing around it and it's pulling that or the energy is, is coming out of the, the inner one. So that's an example of a, a, a jacketed PFR. Um, the other option, the one that's probably used more often because it's got a double use in, in um, other industries, so we have some good design rules for it, is what we call a shell and tube um, jacketed PFR. And so a, a shell and tube takes your total flow here 
I'm going to make that arrow bigger. Let's say it was a, a very large arrow, right? You take your total flow here, and then you split it up into smaller flows and send it through a bunch of tiny tubes, right? And then each one of those tubes is coated in a big layer of fluid. Um, the, the way that you get the uh, fluid to go into different tubes is, again, if you imagine a cross-section here at the inlet to each one of those tubes, it's actually this big circle, right? You can imagine a, a disk with a bunch of holes drilled inside of it, and on the back side of those holes are a bunch of tubes. So when the fluid goes into uh, each one of these areas here, right, that's like going into the page, that corresponds with actually going down the length of the reactor here. Heat exchangers like this, this shell and tube jacketed PFR, it, it, Google them, <laughs> see if you can see a cross section of them to see the flow pattern in them. It's hard to visualize, but they're actually easy to build. Um, it, it's just kind of hard to visualize. So it's either you take a big pipe and wrap it in an even bigger pipe, um, or you take the original big pipe and break it up into lots and lots of tiny little pipes and then just let stuff fall um, all over it like water and stuff like that. The jacket is usually done for the whole length of the pipe. Uh, for, for either one of these. Yeah, something like uh, I remember seeing your um, 3D print in Singe 4. So uh, the energy transferred to and from the PFR. Energy transferred uh, to and from uh, the PFR uh, is, oh, I'm going to highlight this in red, per unit volume. I put that in red because that's the key point that's different uh, between a PFR and a CSTR. In a CSTR, we just knew the area, right? We would tell you, oh, it's a cylinder of such and such a uh, diameter and such and such a height or something like that, uh, and we would just calculate the area, right? It was a geometry problem. But in the um, PFR, the, the problem is a little bit different because we're dealing with a differential, right? So our differential was dt dv is equal to this delta q. There was a term, up, I might as well just write that term. Um, what was it? I actually can't remember. I think it was plus. Uh, r times delta h divided by the sum of ni cpi, right? And so every term that um, we have on the, the numerator over here tends to be a per unit volume type term. There is no unit volume on the ni, there's no unit volume on the cpi, uh, and yet there is a unit volume on the left-hand side, which means the two terms on the, the right-hand side in the numerator, it was minus, thank you. I, it looked funny when I wrote it, thank you. So all of the per unit volume stuff in the energy balance is in the numerator um, on the right-hand side of the equation. So the little delta Q um, is going to be a per unit volume. So this delta Q, let's take a little closer look at it. Remember we had said was UA times TU minus T. If we were to look at what the, the typical, um, yeah, I omitted the summation just because I thought it was easier. If, if there's one reaction, then it just looks like this. Um, but if it's a general one, then yeah, there's the summation in there. Um, if we look at the units on here, part of the units are the same, right? So the Q that we saw for the CSTR had units of something like energy per time, right? Like a joule per second, something like that. But now we're talking about every little unit volume that I go down are the length of my reactor, how much energy can I take out? Um, and so there's a, a term in the bottom here that is per unit volume, which is cubic meters. Um, and this will end up having to match uh, the other stuff that we have. The problem is though that the other stuff, this one, the U is unchanged. So the U here is a joule per second per meter squared per Kelvin. The T I'm going to leave the A for a minute. Right, so this is our U. Uh, and then we're left with a, a Kelvin over here on top. So T 
these come over here. The question becomes, what's that unit of A, right? And in fact, what is A? Um, A is the thing that's new compared to the CSTR. Um, and A is the surface area. which is available for heat transfer. So kind of a lengthy definition there. Surface area available for heat transfer divided by the volume of the reactor. Right, and if we do something like that, we get kind of a weird set of units. Surface area is meters squared. Volume is meters cubed. So the little a has a, a somewhat unusual unit of inverse meters. So for a cylinder, uh, if we wanted to calculate a, the surface area of a cylinder, let me draw my uh, ratio here first. The surface area of a cylinder is pi times d, right? That, that gives you the circumference of a, a cylinder times the length of the reactor, whatever that length happens to be, so pi dl. The volume of a cylinder uh, in terms of uh, diameter is a quarter pi d squared times l, right? So that's the cross-sectional area of a circle multiplied by the length that you go down a um, tube or a, a reactor in this case, um, and that gives us a volume. As a result, this becomes 4 over d. Usually this will be constant, right? Try to visualize what it would mean to have a non-constant A. It means that you would have to have a non-constant diameter. So you, you would have to have somehow the surface area to volume ratio is changing as you go along the length of the tube. So you'd have to have like the tube would suddenly get smaller, the tube would suddenly get bigger, or I don't know, maybe somebody hit it with a baseball bat and it got smaller in one portion. Uh, don't run a chemical reactor in an area where people are prone to hit it with baseball bats. That's pro tip, pro tip when you go out and work for um, someone. If you see someone routinely hitting a reactor with a baseball bat, there could be a problem. Um, I would like to do a line here. We're gonna do something that I haven't done yet, but is very important. Safe design ideas. This little A, the, the key feature behind that A, we have actually in, encountered before. Um, we would have known it for a CSTR, um, but we, we didn't explicitly note it in a CSTR. Um, this is the first time that we've actually explicitly come into this, this concept that we've got uh, right here. And so what I want you to keep in mind um, is that generally, surface area, Let's do surface area as red. Sorry, that's blue. That's what I wanted though. Surface area um, scales with what we call the length squared. Right, when you, when you go to calculate a surface area of anything, it usually looks like the product of two terms. It, it looks like the product of one term that has units of length and the product of another term that has units of length. We saw that up here in the top, right? When I wanted to calculate the surface area of my cylinder, I took something that had a unit of length and multiplied it by something else that had a unit of length. Um, and so, the, generally speaking, a surface area always depends on what we call the length squared, right? We, we say that it, this, this means that it, quote, scales as the length squared. That is in contrast to the volume, right? Typically, whenever we calculate a volume, the units on the volume look like some kind of a length cubed. Right, so when I calculated the, the volume of a cylinder, I had a, a D and I squared it and got units of meter squared and then I multiplied by an L and I got a unit of a meter cubed. Um, and so generally speaking, this uh, ratio is 
or not this ratio, sorry, these two uh, things are what we call scaling relationships. Um, and so you will see more of this uh, in CENG 101A. But generally speaking, surface area scales as what we call the length squared, and volume scales as what we call the length cubed, um, terms that look like the length cubed. The surface area is also the thing that is proportional to heat transfer. Unfortunately, the thing that is proportional to the volume uh, is the reaction energy release. Right, so the, the amount of energy that comes off of a reaction um, is dependent on the amount of stuff that you've got inside of there. Um, you can take a look back at your uh, CSTR design for that, or even in the PFR derivation, uh, we had a volume term that sat inside of there. The problem is that the heat transfer um, doesn't do what we call, it, it doesn't scale the same as the um, energy release. And this is the very first time that we can see that. Uh, the first, and actually have an expression that describes exactly that, uh, which is this expression that we were just working on here a moment ago. This one is specific to a PFR, um, but it is exactly an impact of surface area scaling as length squared and volume scaling as the cube squared. So what happens as the diameter of the pipe gets bigger? Well, what 4 over D says is as the diameter of the pipe gets bigger, the volume is getting bigger to the cubed power of length, but the area is only getting bigger to the square power of length. And so that ratio of surface area to volume is actually going down, right? And we see that in this expression because as diameter gets bigger, the little a that we've got on here um, is getting smaller. This is, hold on, this came up. Let me pull up this one. There are very few times where I stop the lecture, let me stop, and I ask you to pay attention to me right now. I'm not going to write anything. Do not forget that surface area scales more slowly than volume does. If you make something bigger, the inherent surface area available for heat transfer goes down. If you forget this when you are scaling something up, the problems can be significant. So I'm going to post a couple of things in chat right now. Um, I will also post them on our uh, link. I don't know why YouTube is starting. Oh, I accidentally clicked on it. Um, this first link, so both of these are going to YouTube videos that you don't need to watch right now. Uh, but both of these are going to what are called the Chemical Safety Board investigations. Both of them, in the, in the first one, it's about 20 minutes long. There are at least two examples of in there where either a reactor exploded or a building exploded because the scale-up design from a lab was not appropriately applied to a, an actual reactor. So somebody said, I have a particular heat, ex heat exchanger on my little reactor that works really well. All I'm going to do is just double everything to make it bigger or triple it or multiply it by 10. The problem is if you do something like that, the relative ratio of the area to the volume does not scale in the same way, right? It actually gets worse. And if that gets worse, you have less area for heat transfer. And so you have less ability to actually remove energy from the reactor. It will run away and explode. And it does not need very big differences, right? If you go to about two minutes, there was a uh, two minutes on the, the second, no, the first video, there was a plant at a company called Synthron. Uh, all they had to do was increase the amount of stuff that was in their reactor by 12%. Um, and they dumped it all in where they shouldn't have dumped it all in, and the thing blew up. Uh, at about 11 minutes, sorry, 12 minutes in that um, first link, again, they, they had designed the reactor at a lab scale to have a particular surface area to volume ratio that they didn't retain when they actually moved it to a production scale, and it, it released a, an awful lot of toxic gas. And then the second link there was to a T2 laboratory um, experiment. It wasn't an experiment. It was a, a failed production system where the jacket was, again, designed to have a, a particular surface area to volume ratio at the lab scale, and they didn't maintain it when they scaled up. And as it turns out, there was a, a particular set of operating conditions where that ratio was important enough that the reactor ended up blowing up. Um, that one, I think, killed two people. Uh, 
these things are very important and they're very subtle. Uh, in fact, if you go towards the end of the first video, they actually point out that one of the things that the, the chemical safety board decided was we have to talk about this more in chemical engineering undergraduate education. They narrowed out, our, they, they called out our degree program and they called out exactly the class that you're in right now and said, you have to know about this. So it's not that you now have all of the design capabilities to do something like this, but please keep in mind that surface area to volume does not scale well when you bring things up to, to higher scale. So you have to be very careful when you're designing something like that. So there you go. You should be aware of that now. Don't forget it. Um, we're going to do plenty of examples um, that talk about heat transfer, but when we start doing these examples of, of energy balances and things like that, they have real consequences. Um, so please don't forget them. This is one of the ones where I take a moment to actually call that out because you need to know. Um, and I'll post those links uh, as well in our um, summary of the, the lecture that's on our um, website. So safe design, always keep in mind that the scaling relationship between surface area and volume is generally not in your favor. Um, you, you have to work hard to keep that same amount of heat transfer. Those videos are actually really good too. Um, the one is a little bit grainy, uh, but they are really good videos. So I suggest you um, find some time to watch them. In fact, I will probably put a quiz question, something about what I just said um, on the, the review quiz. So let's take that uh, xylene example that we had a moment ago. What if we wanted to calculate the temperature of the utility uh, that was needed to maintain, to keep isothermal conditions? Right, you can imagine if you're out on a plant floor or something like that and somebody's running this xylene operation and you're actively cooling it, it's an exothermic reaction as we saw before, there are a couple of things that you can monitor, right? There's, there's probably a bunch of temperature probes all over the place. Uh, and if you had an idea that, you know, this thing is supposed to be isothermal the whole time, we can do a calculation like this that says in order to flow a utility through, you know, a heat exchanger or something like that to cool this thing, what temperature does that utility need to be in order to maintain an isothermal operation across my reactor? That way, when you're out walking around on the, the surface of a, a plant floor or something like that, and you can look over at the, the temperature reading of your utility, you'll have something of an idea of whether or not that's enough um, to keep your uh, system operating isothermally. So if we wanted to um, solve that, we would start with our general energy balance and say dt dv, uh, is equal to our delta Q minus R delta H uh, divided by the sum of Ni CPI. But we said it was isothermal, right? So our isothermal case, kind of as we saw in the, the CSTRs, when you have an isothermal case, it, the energy balance simplifies quite a bit. You can just solve the material balance first and then look at the energy balance. So because this is isothermal, we know that the left-hand side of this has to be equal to zero. Why is that equal to zero? Because if the, the reactor is isothermal, it doesn't matter where I go along the length of the reactor, what volume element I'm looking at, it's always the same temperature. Um, and so there is no slope to the temperature profile, it's just a flat line because it's isothermal. Uh, we can move this over to the uh, left-hand side, the, move the denominator over to the left-hand side. Um, and what we end up with is something that's similar to the expression that we had for um, the CSTR, which is that the uh, heat transfer per unit volume delta Q is just equal to R delta H. Uh, and we can calculate this based on the uh, outlet stuff that we had before, CA minus CB over KC is our rate, times our delta H, remember, would be um, delta H ref if we want to do adjust that for temperature, as we saw later on in our CSDR discussion, uh, it's T minus T ref. So if I went to um, appendix B in your book, I think, or no, D in your book, uh, usually this would be calculated as the sum of the stoichiometric coefficients times delta H of formation. 
at a reference state um, so that this reference state is 298k. The T here is our reactor. And we happen to know that that was 90 degrees C. So we have all of these numbers, right? We can plug in the numbers that we got from our um, material balance uh, because we know how much of everything is, is coming out. We can calculate this as 0 0.011 moles per liter per minute. And we can calculate this term, I'm gonna erase my reactor over here, as minus 1.13 kilojoules per mole. Notice that the units work out again, right? But they're kind of a weird looking unit. Um, it still ends up being something like an energy per volume. In this case, it's length per time. And in this case, it's minutes, right? If I take this one and multiply it by this one, I end up with energy per volume per time, um, which is exactly the same uh, set of units that I need over on the, the delta Q side. All right, so this term is then equal to, if I sort of build off of the left, the delta Q uh, is now equal to UA TU minus T. And that, based on what I just calculated, uh, is going to be minus 12.43 joules per liter per minute. So I converted from kilojoules to joules because that's a very small number. It's also um, exothermic, right? We have a negative sign here. So we have to use some kind of a cooling liquid, mostly, uh, some kind of a cooling medium uh, in order to, to keep this thing isothermal. Because it's exothermic, that energy is coming out. It needs to exit the reactor somehow. Um, and the only way it's going to do that is if the, the fluid for the utility is colder um, than the actual reactor. The summation of um, NiCPi, I moved it over to the left over here. There was a zero over on the left-hand side, so I moved it over and multiplied it by zero. Um, so it went away. The U, that hasn't changed from our um, previous definition. It's still one over H plus one over HU and then inverted. Uh, so xylenes are organics, um, and if, if, let's assume that we're using water to cool this thing. Um, so water is a, a liquid, so we can calculate this uh, U to be one or sorry, 600 uh, joules per second per meter squared per Kelvin. This, as you'll recall, um, or, or maybe you don't recall, right? You notice people say that, that they're like, as you will recall, and then they tell you something that you don't remember. Um, this was equation 4.28 combined with the data in table 4.1. But that calculation has not changed from our, our CSTR. The reason that I wrote that number out rather than just tell you what it was, be careful with the units, right? Anytime that you calculate the, va the units on U or a value of U, uh, at least in the units that I've given you in the book, they're always going to be like this. And those might not match the units of the system that you're dealing with. So for example, the unit of time will always be seconds, but in your problem, it may not be, right? The, the problem here is, uh, has units of, of minutes instead of seconds. Similarly, the length scales will not be the same. Uh, we have a length scale of a meter down here, right? We've got meters squared uh, and we've got liters up here. So there's very often unit conversions um, involved on the energy side because the scales of energy length and time um, are all, not always the, the same. Um, so, so don't forget those. Um, if we wanted to uh, actually answer the question and say, what is the temperature of the utility that we would expect? We have to know something about the size of our reactor. Um, and so we, we have to make sort of some guesses here. And we're just gonna summarize a, a few different guesses. And then we're gonna try to interpret this as, what do I have to be worried about in terms of, of safety for this particular problem? So let's pick some diameters of our reactor, right? So remember our reactor is a tube. Uh, if oh, our reactor is a tube going this way, nowhere in the problem statement so far have we said what the diameter of the tube is, right? From here to here, this is our diameter. 
All we've said is what's the total volume, right? We haven't said anything about the diameter. So we're just gonna have to see what it looks like for different diameters in order to decide what's the temperature of the utility have to be. So we'll just pick some diameters, right? And we'll scale these as centimeters. Um, and then we're gonna compare that to something in the real world, right? Something that's got roughly the diameter that we're interested in. Just for um, convenience, it's not required anywhere in the calculation. We're also gonna calculate the length of the reactor in meters so that you can begin to get an idea of how big do these things look, right? And that can be helpful when you're designing a, a heat exchanger. Then we are actually gonna calculate the utility, right? We can say that the required temperature um, for the utility in order to maintain isothermal operation can be solved by this equation. Right, I can rearrange that equation for TU because I already will know uh, everything else that's in there, right? I will already know U, that's a constant. A will be equal to four over D. So as soon as I set D, I have also set A. We already know the reactor temperature is 90 degrees C uh, and we just calculated the right-hand side as 12.4. As so I can rearrange that uh, and solve for TU as being equal to the reactor temperature plus the delta Q term divided by UA. And I'm gonna express all of this in degrees C Celsius, just cause I think that most of the time people have a better idea of, I mean, I know Fahrenheit better than I know Celsius, but I know Celsius a lot better than I know Kelvin. I have very little intuition about what's high in Kelvin and what's not. So let's say this thing were 10 centimeters, right? We don't know exactly um, what that means yet. If it were 10 centimeters in diameter, um, 10 centimeters in diameter is about four inches um, and four inches is about eh, like close to eyeball to eyeball, right? So if you imagine a circle like roughly eyeball to eyeball, or if you've ever gotten like a two liter bottle of soda, that's got a diameter of, of um, roughly uh, 10 centimeters, something like that. So this is close to the diameter of a two liter bottle of soda. So now imagine that two liter bottle of soda. If you needed that thing to be 200 liters uh, in volume, the length of that would have to be 25.5 meters. That's pretty long. That's like 100 feet. That's probably like a six lane highway, something like that, right? Or it's usually about 10 feet per story. So if this is 80 stories, or sorry, 80 feet, that's like an eight story building. Um, maybe six stories if, if they're exceptionally tall. That's a pretty long piece of tubing, um, but it's only 10 centimeters wide, right? It's only about this big around. If we calculate the necessary utility temperature in order to maintain isothermal operation from this, we get an interesting number. Remember the um, temperature inside the reactor was 90 degrees C. Um, there was a question in chat, how did I get the length? Uh, the length came from the volume. So we knew the volume was um, 200 liters. So I can calculate the, vol the length of a cylinder with the volume equation for a cylinder. Remember the, the temperature in the reactor is 90 degrees C. The temperature of the utility has to be below that in order to maintain isothermal operation because the reaction is exothermic. The temperature of the utility that we require is 89.99 degrees C, which is basically the same as the um, reactor, right? It, it's almost identical. It, it's not quite identical, but it's very, very close. The reason, uh, there's, there's two possibilities for that. Either A, the, the reaction doesn't give off a lot of energy, or B, you have picked such a tiny diameter that you have an enormous surface area to volume ratio, and it's very, very, uh, I, I want to say easy. It's not really a question of easy or difficult, but there's, there's plenty of opportunity for that heat as soon as it is generated to very quickly find its way, or that energy as soon as it's generated to very quickly find its way to the wall of the reactor and then escape through the coolant. So those are two possible interpretations of this. How could we figure out which, which one it is? Let's double the diameter and see what happens. If this thing were actually a 20 centimeter pipe, right? So I went from about as big as just the um, space from one eye to another, 20 centimeters is closer to like the size of your head, uh, right? Somewhere around eight inches, something like that. So if this pipe were fitting in front of you, you could just about wedge your head inside of there. Also, don't do that in an actual process. Um, if somebody asks you what's the diameter of a pipe, 
don't stick your head inside of it. Don't tell them like, yeah, that was how I was taught at UCSD to scale things was to put a human head inside of there. And that's my scale bar. Um, I did not tell you to do that. If you do something like this, you'll get a length of 6.4 meters. I like that. Yeah, that's using your head, right? So it's, it's bigger in diameter, but it doesn't have to go as far, right? 6.4 meters, uh, you multiply that by three, it's about 18, maybe 20 feet, something like that. So now you're only talking like a, a two-story building, uh, maybe three if it's a short story. Uh, and so what happened to our um, utility temperature for something like that? It barely nudged. 89.98, right? We still need, the thing is basically isothermal on its own, right? The, the utility temperature is nearly identical to the actual reactor temperature. Even if you double it again, right? And remember that the doubling diameter is, is terrible for your surface area to volume ratio, right? This is like the worst thing that you can do is you keep doubling the diameter and your surface area to volume ratio just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's a terrible thing to do. Um, 40 centimeters is about shoulder to shoulder. And as with heads, do not ram somebody's body inside of a pipe and say like, yeah, that's shoulder to shoulder distance. That's about 40 centimeters, something like that. But if you go from about shoulder to shoulder, that's a 40 centimeter pipe, right? That's a pretty big pipe. Um, you could definitely, if you ever watch Columbo, you could definitely hide a body in a 40 centimeter pipe. Also not something that I recommend. Um, but there was actually a, Col a Columbo episode. He was a detective um, and somebody at a chemical plant murdered somebody. They didn't hide him in a, a, a pipe, um, but I thought it was relevant for the discussion. If it's even bigger, right, 40 centimeters, you still require virtually no cooling capacity, right? The, the temperature of the utility only needs to be 89.96 and it will still keep the thing isothermal. So what this tells us is that the way that this reaction is operated, one of two things um, could have been true, right? Either the pipe was just always so naturally small that we had a huge surface area to volume ratio and so we could cool things really effectively. This little analysis that we did here shows that that's not really the case, right? You can double the diameter and double it even again. It doesn't really affect the cooling requirement that you have. And so you have to look to that other thing, which is the enthalpy of reaction is not very high. Uh, in this particular case, the enthalpy of reaction, even at the temperature of our reactor, was only like a kilojoule per mole. That is really, really tiny. Uh, and in fact, the rate term that we have here that's multiplying it is also pretty darn small. Um, the conversion was okay, so it's not that that rate is, is necessarily too small, because um, we did have an okay conversion. But the key thing with this problem is the reason that the utility is not particularly taxed for this cooling operation is that the enthalpy of reaction is not particularly big for this particular case, right? Think of all of the other things that could change, right? If the temperature changes, Kc changes, the rate changes, right? The, the rate went up, that's a problem. Um, it could be if somebody is suddenly dumping in a lot more material, maybe your C sub A just went through the roof and now suddenly this becomes a, a, a problem. So the, the requirements for cooling things can change very, very quickly, but you can predict all of those things based on the energy balance, um, which is what we did here, right? We, we just use the energy balance as a means of evaluating how stable this thing is likely to be under fluctuations, um, for example, fluctuations in, in pipe sizes. Um, but it all comes back to the energy balance. So we're a minute over. I don't want to keep going um, more than this, but I am also, again, happy to hang out for another like five or 10 minutes. Um, I do have to work on something shortly after this, so I, I can't hang around for like 20 minutes like we did before. Um, but nevertheless, that is our lecture. Um, I will see you on Friday with uh, John. For the next couple of days, we're just looking at examples um, of, of PFRs. You're very welcome. Um, I'll turn on uh, a little bit of music over here again. We'll stick with the uh, Final Fantasy VIII. There's that. Let me make sure that that is working. Yep, that's for sure. So if you got any questions or anything, throw them up in chat. Um, otherwise, thanks all.
um, energy released due to the reaction is the same on the surface area for heat transfer ratio is decreasing. Yeah, for this particular one it is. Uh, because we uh, specified like as part of our problem statement that everything inside the reactor is the same, um, like in terms of temperatures and, and rates and stuff like that. Yes, that's right. So, uh, well, so careful, it's not that the less length requires a lower temperature, it's the surface area to volume ratio, right? So a, a longer uh, tube has a higher surface area to volume ratio. And so you don't need as much what we call thermal mass in the coolant. The, the coolant doesn't need to have an ability to absorb very much energy in order to maintain isothermal operation. If you keep making that diameter bigger and bigger and bigger, you'll notice that the required cooling temperature goes smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, which means you have to you have to have a colder and colder and colder utility in order to regulate your reaction um, as the, the surface area of the ratio gets, gets smaller. Um, is there, oh, that's an interesting question. Is there an administrative push to turn on video cam? Not that I know of. Um, to, to my knowledge, uh, there hasn't been a push for that. The only administrative push that I'm aware of um, is that everything has to be recorded. Uh, which if, if you're being recorded on, on Zoom and you don't want your face to show up, you kind of have to turn off your cam because uh, otherwise the active speaker view uh, might jump over to you. Um, so Miguel, I noticed your hands up, so I unmuted you. What's up? Unless you wanted to go by, oh, okay, you just send it over in chat. No problem, I'll just read through chat. Oh, uh, question on the review quiz? Sure, I'll uh, send you the um, solution code for it so you can take a look at it. If, if I'm eyeballing your question, Miguel. It looks like the stoichiometric coefficient of A was probably 2, and your delta H needed to be divided by that, which would have halved your uh, enthalpy. this and you're not part of the class, don't put bodies in pipes. That's not cool. <laughs> 